the avoidance piece of trauma is a lot of times the biggest piece that we're dealing with. Because if we take away your substances, now you've got all of this trauma that comes up that you may not have remembered, but it's there. The brain remembers it. We're just really good at kind of disconnecting from it. You are listening to The Dr. Haley Show, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your health. Each episode, there will be an interview or a message to help you discover better health. We will be featuring health radicals on the show to bring new ideas to the table, as well as doubling down on key fundamentals to support you living your best life. Your host is no other than the founder of Haley Nutrition, Dr. Michael Haley. This is the Dr. Haley Show podcast, and today I'm meeting with Chrissy Clark from Ripple Ranch in Texas. And Chrissy has a master's degree in social work from Texas State University and lots of certifications and initials after her name. Today we're going to be talking about trauma and substance abuse and overcoming these things and some treatment options. Chrissy... Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me today. I understand you're in the beautiful state of Texas. And yes. you grew up there most of your life. I did. I grew up in a little town called New Braunfels that's kind of settled between Austin and San Antonio. So kind of a touristy town. And yeah. I am curious. How would you choose social work and recovery and trauma? in your life? I mean, I definitely had some of my own personal experience with like family members that dealt with mental health and substance use. But I think that where it really clicked for me was when I was doing my master's internship, I worked, worked and did an internship at the same time at a place, a facility called Austin Recovery. It's no longer there, which is sad, but just in working with the clients there, I started to see these patterns of trauma. And so I got really interested in trauma. I got EMDR certified, uh, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing, which is a trauma treatment, and got certified in that pretty early on in my career. And Can you say that again? Was it eye movement desensitization? What was it? Eye movement desensitization reprocessing. What does that mean? So it's a trauma treatment that uses eye movements. And there's a lot of theories on kind of how it works, but we have a lot of evidence that it works. And it uses the eye movements to almost simulate like what happens in REM sleep. So like if you ever watch somebody sleep and their eyes are kind of moving back and forth, that's usually the time when they're in that. REM stage of sleep. And that's the time when the brain is processing things, the day's events. And so it's kind of the time when your brain is sort of organizing and um, compartmentalizing things. And so the eye movements seem to kind of relax the brain into a state where it can kind of not be so defensive about processing trauma. Um, and that's just kind of one explanation. There's a lot of explanations about all the little mechanisms that are happening, but it's pretty effective and it's really exciting to do EMDR because there's not a lot of talking. It's sort of the process in the brain sort of know how to work and do it. And so it's really effective. And so as a therapist, of course, that's very rewarding because you can actually yeah. help the client move through the trauma. So. I've never heard of it. Is it common? Is it popular? It's Yeah, it's becoming more popular. We just don't have enough people trained in it. So yeah, it's it's definitely one of the, the treatments that most people have heard of now. A lot of people come to our facility because we I try to get all of my clinicians trained in it. And so they're interested in that because it's just one of those that doesn't take a lot of talking and people like that the idea of not having to like kind of relive all of that trauma and talk about it. And some people have already done talk therapy and haven't found it very effective. Mm. And then EMDR is kind of like the icing on the cake. Okay. So. And I didn't mean to cut you off, but 
I okay. hadn't heard of it. So yeah, no, good questions. And, and you have some uh, other trainings. Let me look at some of the initials. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the difference is between CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy and CPT. What's CPT? So cognitive behavior therapy is kind of the base modality where you challenge kind of the thoughts and the beliefs and the emotions that are maybe keeping someone stuck. But cognitive processing therapy uses cognitive behavior therapy to specifically address trauma. So cognitive behavior therapy is very general. It can treat a lot of different things. And it's just looking at thought processes. And then the cognitive processing therapy, there's a specific protocol that you follow where you have someone write their trauma narrative, and then you look for the cognitive distortions that are related to the trauma narrative. So it's just a little bit more specialized form of cognitive behavior therapy. Okay. And then there's TFCBT. And that one is, yeah, that's for kids. So that that one is a trauma therapy based on CBT ah, that's for kids. I got it. I need some definitions too, because when we talk about trauma and substance abuse, there's lots of substances that can be abused. Some people will abuse caffeine, some people alcohol, some people harder drugs, some people food, you can abuse food. What are the substance abuses and what kind of traumas are we talking about? Well, I mean, the substance use, the list just continues to grow. Obviously, we have new drugs coming out all the time. I mean, probably the most common that we see is alcohol. Obviously, that's one of those that's legal and people can get their hands on it anywhere. Um, and so anything from methamphetamines to heroin to even cannabis. We do have some people that come to our treatment center to even get off like medicated assisted treatment. So maybe they've been using methadone to try to get off of heroin, but now they want to get off the methadone, which can really be a difficult detox. So all, all kinds of substance uses that we see. And what was the second part of the... Well, trauma. There's the horrible traumas that we all hope we never go through, emotional and abuse traumas. What is the range of trauma that we're dealing with? Again, a very wide range. I mean, we have kind of what we designate as like little T traumas and big T traumas. So little T trauma would be traumas that maybe happen over and over again, and maybe they're not super impactful in if it was just a one-time event, like for example, would be having maybe an alcoholic parent. So it's unpredictable. Like you may go home one time from school as a child and everything's fine. And maybe that goes on for a month, but then you have one time where you go home and they're, the, the parents drunk and they're abusive or they're aggressive. And that goes, goes on over the span of your childhood that would be like a little T trauma, whereas a big T trauma would be something like a huge car accident where someone passed away or maybe a military experience is what a lot of people mm -hmm. think of. Mm -hmm. We have people that come who witnessed a suicide. So it's, it, it, and it's really not about like the actual event. It's really a lot of times more about how the person experienced it and kind of what happened while they were having the experience. And I suspect in this is sexual abuse trauma, probably emotional abuse trauma, physical abuse, the whole spectrum of traumas. Now, people don't always know that they have trauma or they may not recall it. Are we dealing with those too? Oh yeah. I think Remembering it is an interesting thing because I think that's a big part of what we are looking at when we're thinking about like a diagnosable condition like post-traumatic stress disorder. Because a lot of times people, I kind of think of it as like we're in this avoidance epidemic where we have so many ways to avoid our pain nowadays, like you mentioned, with food, with substances, 
sometimes people are workaholics, like they just work all the time because they don't want to sit. They can't be still. They can't um, just kind of feel their feelings. So I think that uh, the avoidance piece of trauma is a lot of times the biggest piece that we're dealing with. Because if we take away your substances, now you've got all of this trauma that comes up that you may not have remembered, but it's there. The brain remembers it. We're just really good at kind of disconnecting from it and compartmentalizing it and shutting it away. But what we know is that over time, that really taxes the central nervous system because that takes a lot of work to like keep those things locked. All right. So a lot of times we're trying to rewire the brain so that the brain understands that like those are things in the past they can't hurt you now just by thinking of them doesn't mean you're going to decompensate um, but it has to be done in a way that's really client-centered and really compassionate because those traumas can be really painful to remember so the trauma the avoidance the substance use it's all kind of tied together. And I think that's one of the things that kind of makes Ripple Ranch unique. When I came in to, as the, I was started as the clinical director, I was more trained in mental health than substance use. And so that's really the route that we've gone with Ripple is kind of trying to really focus on the mental health. And mm -hmm. it's just a really interesting thing to me because a lot of the substance use facilities are like, oh, you guys do mental health? And I'm like, how can you not do mental health if you're a substance use? Because that to me is the core of what we're dealing with. The substance use is a symptom of whatever the person is experiencing. Like no one's mm -hmm. going to give up everything, lose their children, not have a house, spend all their money on substances unless... Mm. They're running from something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I suppose there's probably some com common denominators too uh, when it comes to the substance abuse, not necessarily always trauma related, um, mm -hmm. but possibly something missing in their life too. What would you say the big common denominators are people that are abusing substances? Is one of them trauma? Is one of them lack of love or lack of purpose? What, what would you say the major common denominators are? Trauma. Trauma. I, I think sometimes it's mental health. I, I think definitely healthy connections is really important as human beings. We are, we are, we depend on each other and we need each other. And so, yeah, for someone that like grew up maybe not having good, stable relationships, but I also kind of just think of that as trauma. It's just a different kind of trauma. Like it's that little T trauma. Are you enjoying the show thus far? One of the many health secrets that we have covered on the show is all around aloe vera, specifically drinking raw aloe vera. Our aloe vera has helped our customers effectively heal their gut, increase their intestine health, lower inflammation in the body, eliminate and or decrease acid reflux, have glowing skin and hair, and so much more. Now, as a frequent member of our audience, you will be exposed to exclusive specials and coupon codes for the awesome products manufactured by Haley Nutrition. That's right, for simply being awesome and tuning in, you can get a mini discount to help you optimize and better your health. To see how we can help and support you on your health journey, Tune into the episodes and listen for coupon codes that you can use at www.haleynutrition.com before you make your orders of raw aloe vera. Once again, it's www.haleynutrition.com. Now, back to the show. Um, there's a really good podcast by Nadine Burke Harris about the ACE assessment. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but... She was, I think, in San Francisco practicing medicine, and they kept having all of these kids that were being diagnosed with ADHD. And so she started to kind of look at, like, what's the core issue? Like, maybe this ADHD, we're seeing it so often, maybe it's more of a symptom, um, and there's something underlying the issue. And so they looked at 
trauma is one of the factors and almost all of the kids that were being diagnosed had childhood trauma. So they came up with an assessment called the ACE assessment that we use to look at childhood trauma. And there's all different degrees of it, but what we see is that these avoidance behaviors that I'm talking about kind of start early in childhood and they're actually very, they can be very helpful um, and very functional when you're a kid that has to keep going to school, keep doing your chores, keep doing your homework. And the easiest thing to do if you're suffering some kind of, like you said, sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, and even just neglect, where you don't have yeah. someone that's feeding you regularly, or you're having to take care of siblings because the parents are absent. Um, and so like, it's really effective to kind of compartmentalize. Let me pack that away because I can't deal with that right now. I've got to keep going. I've got to keep surviving. Um, but the trauma is there and then it makes it really hard for kids to like go to school and focus on anything. They're in survival mode. And so that was what her study was about. It's exciting because I'm seeing a lot of movement toward, because our medical model and our, our models for treating people are, in my opinion, not being very effective. Like we're not, we're seeing how like the medical system, although we're spending all this money and throwing a, a lot of pharmaceuticals at people, we also have like the poorest outcomes of all the developed nations. And I think same for our mental health field. I think it's not, we're not looking at the core issue, which in my opinion, a lot of times is some type of trauma or, yeah. or mental health. And it could be the parents have mental health. And so that's creating trauma, or it could be that the child has mental health issues and the parents don't know how to handle that or how to it, treat You know, it. it's a hard conversation to smile through when we're talking about all these traumas and abuse and issues. But I find myself smiling right now because I like what you're saying. You're talking about the fact that, yeah, we're medicating, we're chemically dealing with the symptoms, but mm -hmm. we need to get to the core problem. Mm -hmm. What's causing the substance abuse. And that makes me smile because I believe that is the key. So far, we're very good at, at medicating. We're very good at appeasing us mm -hmm. by squashing other people's symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're not necessarily doing them any favors. Yep. We're maybe buying time. And medicine can be very useful in buying time. But if we don't get to the core of the problem and, the, well, we're going to need medicine forever. And the goal should be to get off medications. Yes. Because and people lose access to the medications for different reasons, whether they lose a job and their insurance runs out or they were on scholarship and now that scholarship money has gone or so it's not a very good long term. I think all of that can be really helpful when you're talking about recovery from substances. Obviously, AA is one that's been around for a long time, but it's not really for everybody. So we need more support groups and, and they're out there. Celebrate Recovery is one that usually like is offered through different churches. We've got Smart Recovery which is hard to, it's sometimes hard to find those meetings. We've got Dharma recovery, which is more kind of rooted in like Buddhist philosophy, which a lot of our clients do like, but again, it's not as easy to access as what AA has done. So AA, NA, all of those are really good. But for somebody that has a lot of trauma, I think therapy is probably that would be my number one recommendation. Like maybe you need some medications if your symptoms are really severe, but meanwhile, be doing therapy because that's ultimately going to teach you the skills that you can carry around with you no matter what. Like no one can take away the ability for you to meditate or be mindful or ground yourself. Like, mm -hmm. so those are, those are skills that people can use no matter where they are or what their financial resources are. Now, for the people that are very do-it-yourself oriented, are there any good books out there that might be beneficial? Any that you recommend? 
There's so many good books. I would say one of the really good modalities that can kind of help a lot of people with different diagnoses is dialectical behavior therapy. And it's an easy one to do on your own because it's very skills-based. And so there's there's a lot of different YouTube videos that explain the DBT skills, but DBT, Marsha Linehan, any of her, her books or workbooks, I think probably would be a really good starting place on a therapy that a modality that you can, you can do yourself. Okay. Tell me a little bit about triggers, what they are, how you identify them and how that's helpful and what you do about it. Okay. Well, I mean, a trigger is something that causes an emotional reaction or a certain thought pattern in a person and um, can lead to good or bad behaviors. I mean, triggers can be good. You can use them in a way that can be helpful. And like an example might be if, let's say I want to establish a workout routine. And so, and this is kind of based on like Atomic Habits. I don't know if you're, that's another book that's really good, but Atomic Habits are, are kind of using triggers in a positive way. So if I want to start a workout routine and I know my best friend goes walking every morning and so I ask my best friend to come and knock on my door or give me a phone call when she wakes up to wake me up, right? So that's like a trigger to get you walking or exercising. But I mean, most of the triggers that we're dealing with are things that are associated to traumatic memories that are not helpful. I can give you an example. I had a client one time that um, she was, we were doing an activity in what we call our barn area. And there's kind of some rooms that are off the main area. And I had them divide up into groups. And she ended up in a room with like three other men, people that like she was living with basically at the recovery center at the time. She knew them. She knew they were safe. Um, and I could see them because the door was open and they were right there. But being in a room with just men triggered her because she had been through some abuse. And so in that moment, even though logically she knew she was safe because those people were not dangerous, the, the, the location was not dangerous, she was safe, I was right there, it triggered something in her that made her feel unsafe. And so her response was to get out, to flee, right? So a lot of times when you have a trigger related to some kind of trauma, your response is that fight, flight, or freeze. And, and so you'll see that triggers can be anything from, it could be a taste, it could be a smell, it can be a, a type of person. Sometimes people don't like working with a certain therapist because it reminds them of their mom or their dad. Or So triggers can be really anything that just kind of creates this feeling that you're back in a moment where you're not safe. Yeah. Does sometimes identifying the trigger help people deal with it too? Because then they recognize it and they say, oh, okay, this particular sound is bringing back this memory, but I can identify it and say, that sound is different. It's not posing the same danger or threat. Does that really help people in most circumstances or do some have to avoid that trigger altogether? Well, I think awareness is definitely the first step in change. So we have to be aware. We do we do work on on being aware of your triggers. And for some people, that is really helpful. Uh, you, For example, like for a lot of addicts, money is a trigger, like cash, having cash is a trigger. So just being aware of things like that, sometimes you can create workarounds where Maybe you do everything with a debit card and you don't have cash because that's that's the trigger. But I mean, ultimately, the goal would be not to have to design your life that way. It would be to kind of confront those things. And and so being that awareness piece is really important. But then like, what are you going to do 
if you still have that emotional reaction to it. And so that's where some, some of the things like in dialectical behavior therapy, the DBT that I was telling you about talks about different skills you can use. Like one example would be urge surfing. They call it urge surfing when it's just understanding that this urge that you have because of this trigger is only going to last for a certain amount of time and then it'll go away and Mm -hmm. you won't feel that way anymore. And so that's the kind of just practical skills that DBT can teach. And then sometimes it's desensitizing them to certain triggers. Sometimes it's having them work through the trigger. So like we'll have male therapists sometimes, and sometimes people don't want to work with male therapists because maybe they had some trauma. But sometimes if you can push people through that initial reaction, they can have a really restorative, healthy experience with a male that's very kind and helpful. And uh, so it's a combination. It's really, we try to be very individualized in how we approach that and meet the client where they're at. And like I said, it's, it's a exposing them, but also giving them the skills to kind of work through the exposure. Yeah, I, I, I'm understanding. I think what you're saying is if they experience that same trigger only in a positive light, it can kind of offset it or counter. To some yeah, extent. I think, well, I think that, that we can use that idea of a trigger in a healthy way. But I think that when you, when you're looking at a trigger and, and I'm, I'm trying to think of like using my example of the client that bolted from the room just because she was in a room with men, like maybe helping her ground, do some grounding get in the moment. So her brain's not in the past, right? Um, where are you now? Look around you using some grounding skills and then having her go back in there, even though she's scared and feels unsafe, helping her to practice those skills. Cause that's how we rewire the brain. That's how we reteach the brain that, okay, but you're not back in that memory. You're in the moment, you're safe, look around you, stay grounded. And that's the beginning of how we like rewire those connections in the brain so that our brain doesn't hijack us in those moments. It's Dr. Haley interrupting this podcast to give you a site-wide coupon code for use at HaleyNutrition.com. You can even use it on our frozen aloe vera and we hardly ever do that, especially when we're running out. Our freezer is almost empty, but we're working hard to convince our farmer to get out in the field for another harvest. You can say this coupon is a little bit of a faith move. So head over to HaleyNutrition.com and use the coupon code FAITH, F-A-I-T-H, for a 7% discount off your entire purchase. The code will work throughout the month of June of 2024. Now back to the Dr. Haley Show podcast. Yeah, um, well, that's interesting. What would you say are some reasons that people avoid getting help? Oh, it's expensive. It can be expensive if you don't have insurance or the insurance isn't isn't great. I mean, even people that have insurance sometimes have co-pays that they can't afford. Um, I think, again, a lot of times, especially for substance use treatment, there's sort of this belief that like AA is the go-to and it doesn't work for everybody. So having alternatives to to just let's push AA. There just aren't that many alternatives. And I think a lot of times people are going and getting help, but not getting the mental health treatment that they need. I'm sure there's, for a lot of families, there's stigma related to that. Um, Knowing when, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of covering up when you're using substances. So people that are addicts, sometimes we don't realize it until it's pretty far progressed. Um, And then just kind of knowing how to get someone into treatment can be difficult. And so for people like that, I would say just call somewhere because usually 
the admissions teams that are set up to take those initial phone calls are really helpful. Like even if they can't get you into the facility that you're calling, they're really good about networking with each other and getting people into a place that takes their insurance that might have the the type of mental health treatment that they need or the type of substance use treatment that they need. So I think it's, yeah, I think it can be very overwhelming when you're in that situation and yeah. difficult to navigate. And I, I could see the people that are closet alcoholics or whatever the case is, and there's some degree of shame or discomfort, or I don't want people to know this even about me or whatever the case is. And yeah, so I don't want to admit that or deal with it. And and I, yeah. I think that I've got this under control right now. Oh yeah. Financially is an interesting one because I would imagine the cost of abuse on yourself is tremendous. Like you say, people lose their homes and their relationships and Listen. and and lives yeah. because they haven't dealt with their challenges. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. But I mean, and and I've heard that argument actually, interestingly, recently that, well, well, I mean, they're spending so much money on their drug of choice, right? But I mean, the unfortunate truth of that is that a lot of them are dealing drugs to support their habit, or they're prostituting to support their habit. And they can't do that when they come into treatment, right? So their stream of income goes away when they're in treatment. So, and that's not everybody. I mean, we have a lot of professional people that own their own businesses or that, that do have financial resources, but for some people it's really hard because they're literally kind of surviving day to day to support their habit. So, yeah. What would you say are some of the things that interfere with results? Not everyone goes out, I I beat this. Mm. Yeah. I think the average is maybe eight treatment stays. I think one of the things is, unfortunately, we don't give them long enough. I mean, we have people that come in that have been literally started using drugs when they were eight and they've now they're in their thirties and we give them 30 days. Um, and so it's just not enough time in my opinion. That's a big part of it. And the system is set up to offer some supports and different levels of care, which if people can go from like a residential facility for 30 days to then like an intensive outpatient program for 12 weeks. And meanwhile, maybe they're in sober living. So they're living in the community with sober people. That usually gives us a better chance at good outcomes. Also, some people, like you said, are just kind of in denial when they come in. So maybe they're forced to come in because their family's like, either go or we're not going to have any, have anything to do with you anymore. And that usually does not work very well. Like you really have to have the buy-in from the person. So sometimes it's just whatever stage of change they're in and they're just not ready. And people, like you said, they, um, they kind of talk themselves into the idea that like, I don't really have a problem. Everybody kind of has their line. Like, yeah, I may be drinking a bottle of wine every day, but I'm not doing hard drugs or maybe I'm popping pills. Like I'm doing Xanax, but I'm not shooting myself up with heroin. So everybody has like this rationalization and justification in their mind, but the the way that we kind of define a diagnosable substance use issue is look at how it's impacting your life. So Mm. have you lost your license? Have you gotten a DWI? Are you having legal problems? Is your family not speaking to you? Like, is it impacting your relationships? Are you being late to work? Are you not showing up for work? Have you lost jobs? So once Mm. it starts to impact your life and you still choose to do the substance, that's when we're like, okay, this is becoming a problem, but not everybody defines it that way. Yeah. Yeah. As a chiropractor, sometimes people will come and they're here for the wrong reasons. And in a discussion and in a case history, and as we're going through this, and I'm trying to figure out whether or not I can help them, 
a lot of times, well, I wouldn't say that often, but there are definitely times where I decide I can't help you. I, I don't think we should even start treatment, and this is why. Now, in bringing that up, I have worked through the reason with people and then was able to help them and get mm -hmm. results. But do you see people like that where they come in and there's just something missing where you have to say, I don't think this is a good fit? And I'm not talking about financially there's something missing. I'm talking mm -hmm. about there's something uh, mentally in their commitment or in their belief. Or if you come and you're skeptical and you, I don't think you can help me because what I hear is chiropractors hurt people. Okay, mm. well, I, I, this is uncomfortable already. Let's talk a little bit about that. Because if we don't come to some kind of agreement here, then then I'm not going to be able to help you. What's mm -hmm. it like when it comes to people needing help with substance abuse and dealing with their past traumas? Yeah, that's interesting, right? Because like here they are presenting themselves to us, you or for help. Um, but then they may be very skeptical about the, the ability. I think that that sometimes can be trauma related because if I start to hope that this might work for me, then there's the chance I could be disappointed and I don't like I'm tired of being disappointed. So sometimes that's what you're dealing with. But yeah, we have people come in to substance abuse treatment and then sneak drugs in like hmm. to the facility. So it's like, well, but, but why are you here? And we understand like for our situation, it's a huge decision to not help someone because it happens to us that, I mean, it just happens that people come in and they leave and they die. Yeah. So we really work hard to try to get buy-in, to try to get them to the right stage of change where they can kind of receive information to have that hope in our program. When I first started at Ripple, I had someone come in. Um, he, he was an alcoholic and he said that he was under the impression that we had a hot tub, that the pictures in the, on the website showed that we had a hot tub and that like, he just, he didn't think it was the right place. He felt kind of misled because we didn't have a hot tub. And a month later he was dead. He no. left and he, he died. He wanted so, a retreat, not recovery. I guess. Yeah. And, and so like we do the best we can to keep people there, but there is always, there is that resistance. Plus a lot of people that come to us have to go through a period of time that's really painful and uncomfortable mm. if they're detoxing. So they have to really be ready to kind of get through that um, physical pain and and then kind of deal with the mental pain. So, yeah, I can um, imagine. I've only dealt with that personally on a small level. If I don't have my coffee every day, I get a little headache. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> but I have seen withdrawals uh, on TV. Never personally. Mm -hmm. You've seen them up mm -hmm. front and I can mm -hmm. only imagine what that's like. Yeah, it's tough. When it comes to any health problem whether it's pain or mental emotional trauma there are things that people can do naturally for instance in medicine a lot of times we'll call it a chemical imbalance which doesn't really mean that your chemistry is off it means that we can change the way you are with chemistry hmm. now i can also change your chemistry by teaching you to think differently or exercise can actually change your body chemistry or a good diet can change your chemistry and maybe we're not eliminating the drugs but we're eliminating the chemicals in the food how important are these natural things in helping someone whether it's nutrition exercise mm -hmm. teaching them about rest or good mental input, eliminating the, some of the TV that's programming them improperly. How mm -hmm. important are those things when it comes to treatment? For me, super important. Um, I, I don't know if you're, if you've heard the Huberman lab with Casey means it's a podcast that he did recently and she's, she's written a book and it was so fascinating to me because she was talking just about what you're asking about, which is, again, like we're treating all of these 
diseases and things with medications and it's not working. It's getting, things are getting worse, not better. And she really talks about mitochondria and that level of like, that's where we should be looking is what's going on in the very cellular level and talks about how that the way we change those, the cells cells that that are kind of giving us all of our energy and life are with natural things like exercise and sun exposure and nutrition. So for us and for me as the executive director, I, I find those things super important. The clients that we have start every day with yoga. We have a Reiki practitioner that does Reiki throughout the day. They do a lot of Tai Chi. We typically incorporate exercise. We're on 20 acres. So there's like paths throughout the woods they can walk in. And the, of course, just the, the regulations make us go through a nutritionist for the food that we're serving them, but we have a chef that prepare, prepares fresh food for them. So uh, those are things that are really close to my heart and, and really important, I think, in, in recovery and just life in general. I agree. I'm curious, do you guys, on your 20 acres, do you grow any food? We do. We have, we don't actually right now grow food. We have a greenhouse and so they do a lot of gardening. Um, but yeah, that's one of the things I've been pushing for is like, let's at least do an herb garden that like the chef can, can use. But, um, but I think that's a, that's a great, that's a great idea. I'd also love to have chickens out there. Oh, I love chickens. I had my own chickens until they got attacked by one of the, what are the night predators yeah raccoons really the raccoons, raccoons. Got them. So we try to protect them we make a place a safe place for them and maybe we don't get home on time one night and they're still out and the raccoons and once something's them found them it's just gonna keep coming back and picking away until they're all gone like it's so yeah but i love the having chickens and maybe a raised bed garden where you're growing some herbs and mm-hmm. just involved in the food where you understand where food really comes from because we're programmed to think that food comes in a package and if we want to make the connection between mental health and nutrition we can create an instant case of adhd in a toddler by giving them gummy bears (laughs) yeah it's it's a quick change and we see their behavior immediately change this is really cool too i think we're finding this out very recently this is new where we're just now understanding we didn't know this when i was in school in the 90s the connection between the gut flora Mm -hmm. and mental health and the communication that happens in these microbes in our body and how they communicate with immune cells in our body and how all of these cells are moving through our bloodstream communicating and how they can also play a role in addictions. Mm -hmm. The microbes will cry out for what they think they need. And sometimes as we're depriving them of what they want, they cry out more and and create those urges. And we actually have to not only reprogram our minds, but reprogram our guts. We need to get those microbes back in balance so that the right cravings are in place. Yeah, agreed. What would you say your favorite testimonial is related to what you do? I always kind of fall back on one of our admissions specialists because she came through Ripple when I first started there. And it's just such a great feeling when you have a client come through and then go on and just do amazing things. And and we require like two years of sobriety before we can hire anybody. But so she was one of our first kind of hires while I was there. And she's just really gone on and does, done amazing things. And she's been able to be there for her kids and be involved with her grandkids. And she was just like at that spot where she was ready. And she talks about how 
what was different with Ripple was the mental health treatment because she had been to treatment before, but she, this was the first time she had gotten the mental health treatment that she needed. So I love that. I love hearing stories yeah. like that. When someone comes to Ripple Ranch for the first time, what's their day look like and their near future after that? Um, well, it depends on if they're coming into detox, if they're coming into detox, the first seven days are usually rest and recovery and, and just trying to kind of get stable. A lot of times the substance use is covering up some other health issues. So kind of getting whatever infections or just damage to the body, trying to get that under control. And they're able to start attending groups as soon as they want to and feel up to it. But our residential program, which is on the same piece of property, they are in groups starting at nine and they have lunch break. And then they're in group until like about five or six every day. And it's just a wide variety of things that we're supporting them with, whether it be grief group, trauma group. Um, different types of trauma or, or therapy modalities, DBT, we have a DBT group, we have CBT group. So all of those things they and do there. DBT is the dialectical behavior therapy and CBT is cognitive behavior therapy. They also do acceptance and commitment therapy, which is ACT. So we have like therapeutic groups woven in with some psycho ed groups woven in with the the kind of holistic treatment that we were talking about with the yoga and the Reiki. And so they do nature and recovery where they work in the greenhouse with the plants. Um, so it's kind of a variety of things that they do throughout the day. And then also supplemented with medical assisted treatment um, and the therapy. Okay. When someone's looking for a, a treatment facility, they're looking for help. What are some of the things you think they should look for? And what would be some of the warning signs, things to run? How do you, when you have a good treatment center? A good treatment center? Well, I think that again, if you're calling a, a facility for help, you want to do your due diligence, ask about their programming. What do they do? Like just the same question you just asked me, like, what does a day there look like? What kind of things will I be doing? I would want to know how often I'm going to meet with a therapist because there are treatment centers that don't, that's not a big part of their programming. Um, and I think that's pretty important. So I would want to know about that. But if there's a psychiatrist that they can have access to if need be. And I would want to get a sense that they're willing to refer me out if their facility isn't the right facility, but also knowing if you want like an AA based program, or if that's not something that really works for you, making sure that they have other options. As far as like warning signs, it's so hard to know once until you get there. Um, but I think if you do that footwork about like what the expectations are as far as therapy and the programming, that those are the most important pieces to know ahead of time. Yeah. How far do people come to Ripple Ranch How, from, from all over the country? Or is it when you're going to a treatment facility, are you usually looking for something nearby? How does that work? We have had people from all over the country come, and I think that a lot of times the reason they're traveling that far is because they want the mental health focus. And again, I think that's kind of one of the things that's a little harder to to find. So yeah, they they come from they come from out of state, and we get them from everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if there's one thing you could fix about the system, maybe it's an insurance issue, maybe it's a law that prevents you from doing something, what would you change if you could change anything about our current system? I have to pick one. Well, <laughs> I don't, I, there's obviously more than one. 
<laughs> no, what, yeah, what are some of the challenges? Like if, if, in my chiropractic, I would say, wait a second, you pay for everything but chiropractic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the barriers to treatment are the things that I would look at. And that, that can be from like our state um, codes that we have to go by, which sometimes we just went through a state inspection and thank goodness we did well, but it's, it's tough. Like it's tough to meet all of the requirements and, um, you know, sometimes you have master's level clinicians that can't do certain things that, that they really are capable and qualified to do. So that basically means you, know, you have to pay for clinical people who have a certain level of licensure um, and that's, that can be really expensive. So, and honestly, some of my interns are amazing clinicians. So I, just some of the state requirements, I think I would like to see updated. I don't think they're up to date. Some of them are too stringent and make it difficult to operate. And then yeah, insurance. I just, I, I, I think insurance needs to be better about working with us and I, I mean pipe dream would be we could have 90 days in treatment hmm. to start out with inpatient treatment for people that have been using drugs for 20 years because 30 days is just not it t sometimes takes 30 days just to get their medications kind of stabilized ah so so yeah it takes so many days to break a habit but you haven't really broke the habit if you haven't cleared their systems yeah interesting interesting what's the best resource people want to find out more or get in touch with you should they go to the corporate website mm -hmm. yeah rippleranch.com and uh, you'll find on there access to information about our program uh, all the programs that we offer because we do have an outpatient as well in san antonio and our admissions team is live usually on there during the day, so you can get help right then. They also have the number to have our admissions line, and that's that's the best way. And like I said, our, our admissions team is amazing, and if we're not the right fit, then they will find. They'll help you with your insurance to figure out what facilities your insurance covers, and they're really good about taking care of people, even if it doesn't mean they're coming to Ripple. Oh, that's great. That's great. So you'll help them find a place that can help them if you can. Yep. Yep. All right. Are there any other things that you wish I had asked that someone listening to the show might be thinking about getting help? Something that I should have asked that you would have wanted to mention? No, oh, I think you did a really good job. I can't think of anything that, that we didn't cover. Okay. So... In the resources area below the video, below the podcast, below any social media, we'll make sure we have a link to Ripple Ranch. Are there any other resources you think we should connect to? Not that I can think of. I mean, maybe the DBT book okay. you can get on Amazon. It's a good I'll one. Make sure it's not I have mine. A, I didn't write it, but <laughs> I'll make sure <laughs> I, I have a link there. You mentioned it earlier. Yeah. Chrissy, that's great. Thank you so much for educating me taking time to answer so many questions i feel like i am empowered a little bit more now in this area so Good. excellent thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for having me i hope you enjoyed that episode today on the dr haley show make sure to hit subscribe on whichever platform you are listening to this if this episode made you think of someone go ahead take a screenshot and share this exact episode with them you can catch the show notes for this episode on www.drhaley.com. If you want to geek out with Dr. Michael Haley on other radical health topics, be sure to check out his YouTube channel where he posts exclusive video content. All the details are at www.drhaley.com and we can't wait to hang out with you on the next episode. <laughs>